Hello folks, welcome to the new series on abdomen and today we're just going to have a very basic introduction to what exactly is the abdominal cavity and what exactly is the peritoneum. There won't be a lot of information given but a little bit of everything. The aims and objectives of this session are first we're going to find out about the roof, the floor and the walls of the abdominal cavity. Then we are going to divide the abdomen into nine quadrants with the use of two vertical and two horizontal lines. And finally, we are going to speak about what exactly the peritoneum is. We call it the balloon within a balloon concept. So I want you to imagine that the abdomen is like a oval balloon. Right? And uh, this is its posterior wall. You can see the diaphragm and a couple of muscles here contributing to it. Right? Then we'll also study the lateral walls on either side and then we'll study the anterior walls. But eventually, I want you to understand that the peritoneum is literally like a balloon lying inside this balloon. Okay? This is kind of going to be your peritoneal balloon. So let's see how that works out. We're going to first go to the 3D lab. Introduction to the abdominal cavity. This is just going to be a very laid back lecture where there's not going to be a lot of information that I'm bombarding you with. It's just going to be a basic introduction to the abdominal cavity and the peritoneum. So first I want you to understand what the abdominal cavity is. It is everything that lies under the diaphragm. Let's use a better word, the thoracoabdominal diaphragm and everything that basically lies above the pelvic cavity. Okay. So if we were to approach the abdomen, the most ideal way to do it would be actually approaching from the anterior aspect. And uh, the reason for that being uh, on the dissection table, that's how you would approach it. So it's just better we start from there. So uh, let's see what we have here. The first thing would be the skin. Right? Now there's a lot that can be spoken about the skin, its dermatomal distribution, etc. But that's something that we prefer discussing in the practical hall, in the dissection hall, whenever that happens, right? So I'm just going to get rid of the skin and we can move on to the next layer. Now that's going to be superficial and deep face here. Okay, this app unfortunately does not really give in a lot of details about that. Probably because it's not that important at an undergraduate level. Anyways, more on that later. Then we start reaching the muscles. Now what we see here are the anterior abdominal wall muscles. Again, not going to talk much about them, but these are basically the three muscles that are contributing to the lateral as well as the anterior aspect, as well as the one muscle that is segmented and seen on either side of the midline, the rectus abdominis, commonly known as the abs. So we're going to revisit these after some time, but first let's have a look at the abdominal cavity. So once we get rid of the layers, the next thing that we're going to be exposed to is something that is known as the parietal peritoneum. Now this has just been labeled as the peritoneum here. Okay, So this app does not classify into parietal and visceral peritoneum. Either ways, I'm going to fade it first and then I'm going to hide it. So as soon as the parietal peritoneum is open, I essentially reach what is known as the peritoneal cavity and we're going to speak a little more about that towards the end of the lecture. And then what is adherent to the organs is known as the visceral peritoneum which is not really seen in this app. Okay, So let's have that discussion on peritoneum later. For now, let's just have a look at what exactly the abdomen is. So you can consider the abdomen as an oval balloon and you can consider the peritoneal cavity as just another smaller balloon inside this oval balloon, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide the anterior abdominal wall muscles so then we can have a better look at the posterior aspect and let's start from there, right? The abdominal cavity has a roof which is contributed by the thoracoabdominal diaphragm. Let's have a look at that. Slightly closer. Oh, look at that. So, the thoracoabdominal diaphragm 
consists of the central tendon, the left and the right cupola. Again, that should be considered in a separate section, so not going into the detail. You can see a couple of openings over there. One of them is for the descending thoracic aorta, which continues as the abdominal aorta below the level of the diaphragm. One of them is for the esophagus, which will continue as the stomach, so on and so forth. Let's not get into the details of that. So that's the roof of your abdominal cavity, right? Let's have a look at the floor of your abdominal cavity. Well, essentially, there is no floor. The abdominal cavity just continues below into the pelvic cavity. So I'm just going to get rid of some other structures that are intervening here. There you go. So that's essentially your pelvic cavity. It can be said to start along the pelvic rib. There's a false pelvis, there's a true pelvis, details of which will be considered in the pelvic region. Okay? So that's your floor. Essentially, it's non-existent. It's just a little inlet into the pelvic cavity. Together, this entire thing can be known as the abdominal pelvic cavity. Okay? Now let's have a look at the posterior wall. The posterior wall is contributed essentially in the midline by the five lumbar vertebrae. That's L1, L2, L3, L4 and L5 with the intervening intervertebral discs and then on either side you have the abdominal muscles of the posterior wall of the abdomen okay chiefly most of them are hip flexors that's your psoas major that's your psoas minor which might not always be present and that is your quadratus lumborum okay so these are the muscles of the posterior abdominal wall Okay, if you trace them downwards, you can see how the iliacus that arises from the iliac fossa and the psoas major together go down, eventually forming the floor of the femoral triangle. If that's reminding you of your lower limb, yeah, good. So, the other thing that we need to know about the posterior abdominal wall is the great vessel. So, we've got the descending abdominal aorta, let's just call it the abdominal aorta. And we, uh, that's on the left side of the midline. And you have the inferior vena cava on the right side of the midline. Okay. They bifurcate somewhere at approximately the lower border of L4 or the upper border of L5. Okay. I'm just going to make them disappear again. And now let us kind of get a view of the lateral wall. So to get a view of the lateral wall, I'm going to add the anterior abdominal wall muscles again. Okay. Right, so there we go. Your lateral wall is contributed by the following muscles. Firstly, you have the external oblique, observe its fibers going downwards and medially. And if I fade this, you can see the muscle inside it whose fibers are exactly perpendicular, and that is the internal oblique. Okay, so that's your internal oblique. If I hide that, the next muscle inside that is the transversus abdominis with its transverse fibers. Okay? The origin, insertion of supply of these muscles will be discussed in a separate lecture on the anterior abdominal wall. Okay? And that structure forming your anterior abdominal wall or contributing to it just on either side of the midline is the segmented strap muscle that is the rectus abdominis. Okay? There we go. So if you observe closely, the three muscles that form the lateral wall also come anterolaterally and then this light colored region essentially is the aponeurosis of their insertion. And these aponeurotic insertions kind of blend with each other and then again bifurcate to enclose the rectus abdominis muscle inside it. So that's known as the rectus sheath, another important SAQ which will be considered in a different section. Okay. So that kind of takes care of your anterior wall as well. So there we have it. The roof is formed by the diaphragm. The floor is just a continuation into the pelvic cavity. The posterior wall is formed by the psoas major and the psoas minor if present and the quadratus lumborum. These are the muscles. The central uh, line is basically formed posteriorly by the L1, L2, L3, L4 and L5 vertebrae with their intervening intervertebral discs. 
the upper aspect of the posterior wall is also contributed by the crura of the diaphragm now this is the right crus and which extends all the way till l1 l2 and l3 and the left crus is slightly shorter and that extends l2 l1 and l2 okay and finally your anterior wall is contributed by the rectus abdominis and the rectus sheath and the anterior aspect of the three muscles which are from outside within the external oblique, the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. That's the internal, that's the transversus abdominis and it is these three muscles that also contribute to the lateral wall. Okay. So now that you have a basic idea of the abdomen and its boundaries and its walls. Let's get back to the PowerPoint presentation and discuss the abdominal quadrants. And after that, we'll talk a little bit about the basics of the peritoneum. Okay? Okay. Now, to understand the abdomen better, especially when we look at it in a two-dimensional format, it's best to divide it into a couple of quadrants. Now, these nine quadrants are obtained by two vertical lines both of the vertical lines are essentially the mid clavicular lines so the lines that you see here these are the mid clavicular lines if you trace them upwards they're going to be uh, reaching the midpoint of the clavicles if you trace them downwards they reach the midpoint of a line drawn from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic symphysis okay so the anterior superior iliac spine is here somewhere and the pubic symphysis is here somewhere, right? So exactly the midpoint between both of those lines, this is known as a midguinal point, I'm sure you're aware of it, and you've seen it in your lower limb. So the same midclavicular line when traced downwards passes through the midguinal point. So these two vertical lines on either side, and the two horizontal lines on either side, are the upper one is known as the transpyloric plane, it's a line, but of course, if you consider a three-dimensional format, it just becomes a plane. This is known as the transpyloric plane. And uh, it passes from the lower border of the L1 vertebra. So the L1 vertebra would probably be here somewhere. So it passes from the lower border of the L1 vertebra. And... Uh, it also crosses a couple of other structures but we won't get into the detail of that right now. I'm going to give you some examples either ways. The pylorus of the stomach as the name suggests, the fundus of the gallbladder, the neck of the pancreas, the hyla of the kidney, all pass somewhere along this plane. Okay? If you trace it anteriorly, the plane passes through the tip of the nine costal cartilage. Remember the tip of the nine costal cartilage. The lower horizontal line is known as the transtubercular line. Okay, transtubercular plane. And that crosses the iliac tubercles on either side so I hope you've studied the hip bone and you remember what the iliac tubercle is it is a tubercle present about five centimeters behind the anterior superior iliac spine so the line that passes through the iliac tubercles when traced posteriorly also passes along the upper border of the L5 okay it passes along the upper border of the L5 or you can say the intervertebral disc between L4 and L5. So that technically is going to be your transtubercular plane. Okay, and the regions that are divided because of these four lines are, let's start from the center, the umbilical region. This is also where the umbilicus will lie. The umbilicus lies somewhere between L3 and L4. On its left will be the left lumbar. On its right will be the right lumbar. This is where most of the kidneys are. Above you have the epigastric region, on either side of which is the left and the right hypochondriac regions respectively. And below the umbilical region you have the hypogastric 
region on either side of which lies the left and the right iliac regions respectively okay so the concept of the quadrants really help us in understanding a rough disposition of where the viscera lie let's take an example let's see you want to understand from the surface where the stomach lies roughly so we know that the pylorus of the stomach lies at the level of the transpyloric plane. So the horizontal part is already done. Now vertically we know that the pylorus lies about 1.25 centimeters to the right side of the midline. You can call it the midsternal line. Right? So 1.25 centimeters here. This is where the pylorus will lie. Now we also know similarly that the cardiac end lies about 2.5 centimeters to the left of the midsternal line at the level of T11. So if I were to draw the stomach, I would probably draw it something like this. We also know that the stomach occupies the left hypochondriac, the epigastric as well as the umbilical regions and a part of it also extends into the left lumbar region. So there you go. That's your stomach. And this is how we use the knowledge of the nine quadrants to roughly understand where they are situated in the abdominal cavity. Okay. Moving on to the next slide. Now let us speak a little bit about what exactly is the peritoneum. Like I said before, the peritoneum is a balloon within a balloon. So if I were to draw the abdominal cavity as an outer balloon and just draw the lower half of it. So I'm just going to draw the lower half, okay? And if I were to draw a balloon inside it, then I would probably draw it like this. What you need to understand about the peritoneum is that it is never pierced or punctured by an abdominal organ. I like to call it the punching in a balloon theory. Okay, so let's assume that somebody tries to put his fist inside this balloon, right? So as the fist goes inside, the balloon is not going to be punctured, but the part of the balloon that is adherent to the fist is technically known as the visceral peritoneum and the part outside that lies the inner aspect of the body wall or in this case the abdominal cavity is known as the parietal peritoneum okay now if I make the wrist of this fist disappear and draw an organ here instead then this region that is formed will become a double fold of peritoneum right and this double fold of peritoneum inside it will carry everything that the organ needs in terms of nutrition so that's vascularization innervation everything has to basically enter from here so many instances in this series, you will come across such double folds. They can sometimes be called ligaments. They will sometimes be called meso. The prefix meso. That will be added to whatever organ is inside it. So if there is a double fold that leads into the appendix, that will be the meso appendix. If there is a double fold that is surrounding the gut or the intestines or the small intestine rather we'll call it the mesentery meso entery entery means uh, the intestinal tract right enteric tract so this double fold or meso prefix meso added to an organ essentially is nothing but a double fold of peritoneum inside which you have the arteries the veins the lymphatics and the nerves that have to reach the organ Sometimes we just use the word ligament. For example, in liver, we have the falciform ligament. Uh, in between the stomach and the spleen, you have the gastrosplenic ligament. Just understand that these are double folds of the peritoneum in between which you might find vessels, nerves and lymphatics. Okay? 
Now the part of the organ that is not lined by visceral peritoneum is known as a bare area. So if I draw an organ here, this part of the organ that is not lined by visceral peritoneum is known as the bare area. And if you really see this on the dissection table, you'll immediately be able to find out what a bare area looks like because the visceral peritoneum covering an organ always gives the appearance of like a plastic sheet kind of a layer around the organ. And then there are certain areas where that sheet is absent and that is the bare area. You'll be seeing these most prominently in the liver. So what are these bare areas? They are just regions of the organ that are not covered by visceral peritoneum since peritoneum is being reflected of that area. Okay, I hope you understand that concept. Now, let's talk a little bit about the primitive gut tube and how the peritoneum comes to surround it. So now I'm going to take you back to week 3 of general embryogenesis just to kind of understand what exactly is the peritoneal cavity developing from? Okay, and the answer is intraembryonic coelom. So if you haven't checked out my general embryology series, I highly recommend it. It's probably out on YouTube already. Let's see what the bilaminar germ disc looks like and then add the third germ layer, that is the intraembryonic mesoderm somewhere in between right so the vertical ectodermal cells are eventually going to give rise to the neural system and also the surface ectoderm the flattened endodermal cells are going to give rise to most of the gastrointestinal tract and everything in between over here is essentially the intraembryonic mesoderm okay you've got the notochord that comes around day 17 and uh, it disappears in a few days but establishes the central axis of the body to differentiate the intraembryonic mesoderm into paraxial mesoderm intermediate mesoderm and lateral plate mesoderm very soon cavities start appearing in the lateral plate mesoderm that coalesce to form what is known as the intraembryonic coelom that is your intraembryonic coelom correct so by the end of fourth week there is lateral folding as well as cephalocaudal folding what i'm going to show in this figure is only the lateral folding so eventually the endoderm forms the primitive gut tube let's just call it the primitive gut correct and the ectoderm will form the central nervous system, the surface ectoderm, but that is not our concern today. While the intraembryonic mesoderm, eventually after folding, just meets on either side of the midline, right? But the intraembryonic coelom joins on either side, so we have something that looks like this. So that's what the intraembryonic coelom looks like after lateral folding. So this is further going to form the pleural pericardial as well as the future peritoneal cavity. Okay, so what we are studying right now is somewhere at the L1 level. So you can consider this to be the primitive gut tube at L1 level. And the intraembryonic mesoderm in this area eventually takes this form so now the intraembryonic mesoderm that is attached all around the primitive gut tube is your visceral peritoneum or you can call it the splanchnopleuric intraembryonic mesoderm in the embryonic life 
the intra embryonic mesoderm that is in close connection with the body wall is the parietal peritoneum or in embryonic life we can call it the somatopleuric intra embryonic mesoderm and everything in between over here is the intra embryonic coelom or the future peritoneal cavity okay now this little double four that is formed over here is known as the dorsal mesentery over here we are using the term mesentery because we are assuming this to be the region of the small intestine so meso entery and that is dorsal mesentery okay now at the same time there is the development of what is known as the dorsal aorta just dorsal to the dorsal mesentery okay this is going to form the future abdominal aorta and this dorsal aorta gives rise to a few ventral branches that end up supplying the gut wall and there are three such branches that respectively supply the foregut the midgut and the hindgut these are known as the ventral branches of the dorsal aorta and we shall study their names eventually but this is the general schema of the blood supply of the gut tube so if we were to see the same thing in let's say a three dimensional format that's your balloon okay i'm going to draw the dorsal aorta behind over here okay and imagine that there is a ventral branch that is coming like this inside right so what will happen when that happens is that the peritoneum will be displaced in this fashion that is a displaced peritoneal fold and now i'm going to draw the primitive gut tube so if you observe carefully this balloon has now been displaced inside to create your double fold we can just call it the dorsal mesentery and this is the developing gut tube and this is a ventral branch of the dorsal aorta okay so that is the general schema of the vascularization of the primitive gut tube similarly even the veins the nerves and the lymphatics will be traveling along this double fold and that is why most of the peritoneal folds carry the blood supply and the innervation of that organ through this double fold okay so i'm sure by now you have pretty much understood the concept of the peritoneum its classification into visceral and parietal as well as what exactly is a bare area what is a double fold or a ligament that is reflecting off the wall of an abdominal viscera so i want you to take these three points home with you today point number 1 the peritoneum is a smaller balloon inside a bigger one it's never punctured and it's just displaced by the abdominal viscera point number 2 it is further classified into visceral and parietal peritoneum the visceral is firmly adherent to the organ and the parietal is adherent to the inner aspect of the abdominal walls and the double fold formed by the invaginating viscera is usually named using the prefix meso and it is through this double fold that vessels and nerves enter and leave the organ so i think this should be enough of information to give you a basic insight into how we are going to be approaching things in the next lecture we'll be first discussing about how to discuss an abdominal organ that is the proforma of the abdominal organ and then we'll start with the first organ of the series that is the spleen see you soon bye bye